morning, everyone, or good evening to those joining us from Korea or China. Welcome to GW Institute for Korean Studies, or GWIX. I'm Yeon Ho Kim, Associate Director of GWIX. Thank you for joining our Korea Policy Forum on Rock China Relations, Challenges, and Opportunities in the next 30 years. Today's forum is co sponsored by the East Asia National Resource Center at GW. As you know, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties uh, between South Korea and China. Over the past three decades, the two countries have made breakthroughs in anti-Cold War facilities and have developed their bilateral relationships uh, into a growing strategic partnership with robust trade relations and people-to-people -people exchanges. However, these bilateral relations have also been severely damaged by the dispute over the deployment of the fat and growing anti-China sentiment in South Korea. Uh, we are lucky to have uh, uh, with the intensifying uh, strategic rivalry between the US and China, uh, the bilateral relations uh, with, between Korea and China will navigate uncharted waters in the next decade. And we are lucky to have four leading experts from the United States, South Korea, and China who will discuss this, uh, their views on this important topic. So uh, let me ask our first speaker, Hung Gyu Kim, the founder and the director of uh, the United uh, US China Policy Institute and professor in the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at Aju University to discuss his uh, uh, a Korean view of this important topic. Hung Gyu. Uh, thank you very much the, uh, uh, for the invitation. And then I'm very glad to see uh, uh, Xiao He and Patricia and uh, Professor Greg. Uh, let me briefly introduce the uh, you know, changing relationship between uh, South Korea and China, and then also explain some factors influencing the uh, for the future uh, uh, South Korea and China relations, and then also uh, China's uh, policy to uh, South Korea and the implication to the uh, US uh, you know, uh, relations. Uh, since the diplomatic ties on August 24, uh, 1922, 1992, the 30 years of South Korea-China uh, relations has uh, progressed so rapidly, it can be called the uh, miracle of um, bilateral relations. The 30 years of friendship between uh, South Korea and China was largely uh, influenced by following factors. First, there is the uh, uh, favorable international environment of the US-China strategic cooperation. Uh, analyzing South Korea-China relations, uh, we can easily find uh, the uh, strong positive correlations between South Korea and China uh, with uh, US and China relations. So, second, economically, the Korean and the Chinese economies were complementary to each other. Uh, Korea provides the intermediate uh, products and technologies, and China, based on it, uh, did the final ones. Uh, third, the historical and cultural familiarity between the two countries served as a, a, a lubricant in uh, developing mutual relations rapidly. However, these friendly environments have been recently changed negatively. Uh, first, the US-China strategy competition is intensifying. Second, uh, the economic structure of uh, Korea and uh, China is gradually changing from a complementary relationship to a competitive one. Third, after the Saudi incident in uh, 2016, the unfriendly public perception of uh, South Korean people soared uh, to over 80% of the highest in the world with the United States, Japan, and uh, Sweden, and uh, Australia. At the same time, exclusive and nationalist sentiments are intensifying among the young generations of both countries. Uh, fourth, South Korea found after the sad incident that uh, uh, its economic dependence on China is excessive. There is a serious concern China will undermine South Korea's supply chain stability according to its uh, political needs. South Korea has sought to reduce its heavy in, uh, dependence 
on uh, China supply chains since the Moon Jae-in government. Uh, let me explain the four factors influencing for the future of uh, Korea-China relations. The four most important factor is the future of strategic competition between the United States and China. If the strategic competition intensifies, uh, South Korea's Yoon Suk yeol government uh, will face uh, the uh, serious challenge in uh, uh, South Korea-China relations. Second factor is identity issues. For South Korea, past experience with China as an adjacent country to China most recalls threat, humiliation, and frustration rather than benefits, rejoice, and satisfactions. The current identity of Koreans is strongly influenced by the success they have achieved under the liberal international order under the leadership of the United States since the World War II. South Korea has become the uh, world's 10th uh, largest economy through industrialization and democratization and informalization. Meanwhile, China is trying to reconstruct the Chinese nation based upon the territory and glory of the Qing dynasty. Uh, the identity constructed uh, based upon the, uh, you know, different viewpoints is now becoming a major factor in conflicts and an antagonism between the two countries. The third factor is the mutual values. South Koreans value uh, democracy, freedom, and human rights, and support of the market economy. Uh, China maintains a socialist authoritarian political system, a hierarchical, hierarchical attitude toward the others. Uh, this is another source of anti antipathy toward China in Korea. The fourth factor is uh, US policies to South Korea, a deficiency of uh, confidence in the United States uh, exists within South Korea. South Korea could not get support uh, from the US in the sad uh, disputes with China. And the, uh, uh, the reason IRA uh, recurred the apprehension of South Korean people, the United States doesn't afford to take care of allies, allies due to its domestic politics. South Korea seriously worries about the US uh, reshoring policies at the expense of its allies. Then what's gonna be South uh, China's uh, Korea policies anticipated? After Xi Jinping was nominated as CCP leader, uh, consecutively three times in the 20th uh, Party Congress, many experts worry about China's warrior diplomacy and military aggression. China would focus more on, however, in my view, uh, neighboring diplomacies and then also the developing countries, uh, the so-called the Global South, lessening optimism of negotiation with the United States in the seas, uh, uh, Xi Jinping's third term. In this scheme, South Korea becomes a linchpin uh, for uh, China's uh, foreign policies. Uh, China would take a balanced approach to both Koreas in spite of North Korea's active uh, you know, call to ship, call to ship uh, toward China recently. Uh, South Korea and China face a double hedging uh, situations, which is China in between South and North Korea, South Korea in between the United States and China. Any negative action taken against the other uh, would automatically cause uh, repercussions. China would seek to establish a new regional cooperation network and division of labor when Wang Qishan, uh, Vice President of China, uh, visited South Korea in May 2022. He suggested the creation of a new supply chain with China, South Korea, Japan, and ASEAN. If South Korea and China turned into adversaries, the issue of demarcation in the West Sea between uh, South Korea and China would emerge uh, with uh, a connotation of a military confrontation and the probable crashes, as well as serious supply chain disruptions. Then uh, what is gonna be implication uh, for South Korea and US uh, relations? According to the poll of the uh, uh, PW research in uh, 2020, South Koreans have more confidence in uh, economic future of the United States than US citizens themselves. The utmost favorable view of South Korean people toward the United States has originated from their historical experience with China and the United States. It is the most important source of the uh, rock us alliance. Uh, maintaining confidence is crucial. For the future of the uh, uh, Iraq US alliance, Yoon Suk yeol government has been well known as the most pro American government in the history of South Korea. During the Yoon's tenure, 
the successful management of the alliance is much more than important than to the future of the alliance as well as to the stability of uh, East Asia. Currently, it deeply engulfed the US-China strategy competition and domestic turmoil in the United States have brought serious concerns from the world. Competition for supremacy, uh, supremacy between the US and China pose tremendous uh, security challenges for South Korea. South Korea would be the stronghold of the alliance, no matter whether a progressive or a conservative government, uh, the rock us alliance has been the pillar of South Korea's diplomatic, security, and economic policies. The height of the strategic competition between the United States and China is expected uh, to increase even more during the Biden era. Uh, South Korea would not be optimistic about its relationship with the United States as well as China. South Korea sincerely hopes the United States policies of reshoring and competition with China were executed at the expense of its uh, uh, sincere hope the United States of uh, reshoring and competition with China should not be uh, executed at the expense of its allies. And then uh, this is the uh, uh, our current you know, impression on the US policies. Thank you. Thank you, Hungyu. Um, in the interest of time, I just briefly introduced Hungyu, and I'd like to ask all the uh, 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 attendees, the virtual attendees, to refer to our website uh, uh, for uh, Hungyu and other speakers' uh, full bios. Um, let me ask uh, our second speaker, uh, Xiaohao Cheng, uh, a professor at the uh, School of International Studies of Rimmen University and a senior researcher at the Pangol Institute to uh, uh, discuss a Chinese view of Iraq-China relations in the future. Xiao Hong. Uh, thank you, Yun Hu, and also thank you very much for, for inviting me. So I'm very glad to meet old friends, Kuz and Patricia. Uh, 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 Patrick, uh, and also uh, I'm very glad to meet new new friends, Greg. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, say some words about uh, Chinese uh, Chinese perspective views, uh, Chinese views over China and the South Korean relations uh, in the past thirty years. And hopefully, so I can so offer some kind of informed predictions about the Sino. ROK relations uh, in the next uh, 30 years. But in order to do so, so we have to do some lessons and experience uh, from the two countries past the 30 years interactions. And uh, the past 30 years uh, development of bilateral relations between China and South Korea could be characterized as fast, fast. In the 1992s, the two countries uh, established uh, diplomatic ties. And then five years, uh, six years later, the two countries agreed to build a cooperative partnership oriented to 21st century. Sounds like remote uh, things happened. And uh, in 2003s, and the two countries upgraded the, their relationship to a uh, comprehensive partnership. And uh, five years later, uh, two countries agreed to build a uh, strategic cooperative partnership. So the relations between two countries in the past 30 years has been, had been upgraded one step by another step very fast. So in the uh, two, 2014, so the two countries could declare they want to build a partnership that could uh, 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 boost, boost the common development, safeguard regional peace, and the revitalization and the promote world prosperity. So, why is the relations between two countries uh, could have grown so fast? There are three basic, I think, it's positive factors. Positive factor ones, uh, the mutual need between two countries were very strong. In the economic field, and China needed a South Korean's investment technology, and the South Koreans needed uh, China's market 
And uh, in the diplomatic field, China needed South Korean's diplomatic recognition to break its diplomatic isolations uh, that occurred since 1989, since 1989. And uh, South Korea also need China's diplomatic relations uh, to finalize its so-called Northern diplomacies and also seek China support to tackle North Korea related issues. So uh, both sides needed each other and, uh, and such a kind of need were very, very strong. Second, the trade was a necessary bond between the two countries. Because as Q mentioned, the, the economies between two countries were complementary to each other's. So such a kind of such a kind of uh, complementary uh, uh, nature of the economic in, in two countries uh, greatly contribute to the fast growth in their trade in their trade, which in turn further cemented the ties between uh, Beijing and the souls. So that's the second most important uh, um, positive factors. And the third, North Korea and the United States acted as uh, some kind of facilitator to sign ROK relations. Uh, why I say so is because the both nations share a common interest in dealing with North Korea's nuclear and missile issues. China was willing to host the six party talks and willing to partition North Korea if the latter develop its nuclear and missile weapons. And also China and South Korea all share a common interest in building good relationship with the United States. And uh, you see, uh, since 1989, the relationship between China and the uh, and United States had experienced uh, some specific period of time. Uh, initially, the relation was pretty bad, and then two countries mended the defense, and the top leaders uh, exchanged a state visit with each other, and then the two countries could conduct strategic and the economic dialogues uh, on two tracks. So uh, relations between China and the United States had, had been steadily improved. And certainly South Korea was United States. Recently, the three positive factors has taken a significant changes. And, uh, and uh, some of the factors uh, began to work against the China and the United States relation and the uh, United States ROK relations. So as uh, Q mentioned, China and the United States strategic competition is the number one negative factors. And uh, sooner or later, and these factors will undermine China and the ROK relation, no doubt about it. And uh, also China is North Korea's ally. And uh, sooner or later, uh, North Korea issues will undermine China and the ROK's relations. So China's ally uh, aligns with North Korea and the ROK's alliances with, alliance with the United States uh, will, continue, will play a very, very negative role and to undermine China and the ROK's relations and sometimes may greatly hurt China and the ROK's relations. And also so, um, to the, the, the mutual need, the mutual need is still there, but uh, it's not as strong as it was. So that's the big change. That's the uh, second change. And, uh, 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 and uh, the third, I like to mention, and uh, the economic, sense, economic ties between China and the ROK also face a significant challenge because 
Initially, China and in our case, economic ties uh, could be perceived as a supplementary. But now, China's economy and the North, uh, South Korean's economies become increasingly competitive. So the three positive factors turn out to become, become a negative factors that may undermine China and our case relations. I'm stop here and thank you for your patience. Thank you uh, for uh, giving us a, a very good uh, food for thought. Uh, uh, in the meantime, let me ask uh, uh, Patricia Kim to share her uh, views of uh, the Rock China relationship in the future. Patricia Kim is a David uh, Rubin M. Rubinstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution holding a joint appointment to the John L. Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Patricia? Well, thanks very much, John Hill. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank GW's Institute for Korean Studies for inviting me to join this discussion today. Um, and I want to commend the Institute in particular for bringing together this panel with experts from South Korea, China, uh, and the US, I think it's always useful and insightful to hear from scholars who are based out in the region and to observe the differences and common threads in our assessments. So this is, um, I really appreciate the opportunity today. I also see intensifying US competition as the greatest challenge and potentially an opportunity for ROK China relations today and in the coming decades. Uh, and in this competition in turn, impacts two key challenges in the Indo-Pacific that have direct implications for both South Korea and China. And these are the North Korean nuclear challenge and growing tensions in the Taiwan Strait. So first on the United States and China, uh, the bilateral relationship as our two speakers already described um, between the two states uh, is really at one of the lowest points in recent history with little to no expectations on either side for a significant improvement in the foreseeable future. And because of the overwhelming focus on competition in both capitals, there is very little, if any, diplomatic space to advance cooperation in areas where the interests of Washington, Beijing, as well as Seoul, Tokyo, and many other parties converge, such as working towards the denuclearization of North Korea and um, towards a sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. In the meantime, Pyongyang has essentially been left to its own devices to continue advancing its nuclear and missile programs since the failed Hanoi summit of 2019 and ramping up its provocations, including a barrage of missile tests uh, that began earlier this year. Uh, we've seen some in the last 24 hours. And of course, we've also seen a number of concerning pronouncements coming out of Pyongyang about its nuclear status and the right to uh, preemptively use nuclear weapons. Now, to be sure, the fact that Kim Jong-un currently has no interest or no intention of giving up its nuclear weapons uh, remains the greatest obstacle to restarting any diplomacy. Uh, but also, there's simply no political bandwidth or incentives for any of the parties to take up the North Korean nuclear challenge at this time. Uh, in fact, broadly speaking, there's growing focus in all capitals uh, on strengthening, not limiting one's own nuclear and conventional capabilities as great power competition heats up. And there's really no interest in arms control or non-proliferation or little interest. And I think the fact that discussions about limited nuclear use have re-entered into the mainstream debate with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is quite remarkable and concerning. Uh, we're also seeing great, pow uh, great power patrons striving to keep their strategic clients and their partners close. So even if Beijing's ultimate interests are not served by North Korea's growing nuclear capabilities, uh, Beijing, as well as Moscow, has continued to shield North Korea at the UNSC, blocking efforts to impose additional sanctions on Pyongyang while directing the blame at the United States and South Korea for failing to sincerely engage with North Korea and to extend its security guarantees, uh, which would essentially require measures like lifting a wide swath of economic sanctions before major steps by North Korea to denuclearize, 
or significant and or significantly diminishing the US ROK alliance, both of which are non-starters for Washington and Seoul. Uh, if you look back at the history of negotiations with North Korea, it's actually Beijing's pressure on North Korea that uh, as its biggest trading partner and as its great power patron that has served as a critical element in providing momentum in negotiations. But today, as Beijing looks at long-term competition with the United States, uh, I think it's really placed a premium on keeping its allies, including Pyongyang, on its sides. And just as Xiaohe mentioned, I think this is really going to drive tensions, not only in the ROK-China relationship, but of course the US-China relationship as well. Uh, also, China's declaration of its so-called no limits partnership with Russia earlier this year and its policy choices around the Russian invasion of Ukraine demonstrate to me that Beijing has become much more intentional about keeping its ideological partners close, even if this comes at a deep cost to its relationships with the United States, Europe, and key Asian states like South Korea and Japan. Um, China, again, has already vetoed efforts to impose additional sanctions on North Korea at the UNSC, it's, and it's demonstrated unwillingness to more strictly enforce existing sanctions. And there have been, there have always been talks about, can we do more to impose secondary sanctions on Chinese banks or, or related entities? But my sense is that doing so uh, would not necessarily shift dramatically Beijing's posture on North Korea. Uh, and I think China's refusal to directly denounce Moscow, despite the global outrage and sanctions regime that emerged since the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a case in point. Uh, in fact, I think that as the United States, ROK and Japan increase cooperation to enhance deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the growing North Korean missile and nuclear threat, Beijing is likely to lash out at such developments for adversely impacting its own security interests, as we saw in 20, 2017, uh, when it fiercely opposed, opposed the deployment of uh, the US air defense system known as THAAD to the Korean Peninsula. And Hyung Yu um, referred to this in his remarks. Uh, and I think it may also continue to employ military pressure, both independently and in conjunction with Moscow, to pressure the United States and its allies. So in 2019, China and Russia engaged in their first joint air exercises around South Korea and Japan. And again, this May, during President Biden's trip to Asia, Chinese and Russian bombers uh, engaged in joint exercises in the region and entered into South Korea's air defense identification zone. So I think as the United States, ROK and other allies uh, step up joint military coordination in the Indo-Pacific, China may also increase its own individual and joint military activities. And this is going to lead to a greater strain on the defense forces and re resources of the United States, ROK and others, and increase the potential for a crisis in the region. Now to turn to the other spot that has potential for high potential for conflict, of course, there's been growing concerns about Taiwan's fate. Uh, with Beijing's increasing uh, aggression across the military, economic, and diplomatic domains towards the island. And I think the shifting military balance in the Taiwan Strait that continues to tilt in China's favor has uh, raised a lot of concerns here in Washington and other capitals. Um, and of course, this has pushed the United States and its allies to ask what can they do more to ensure that Taiwan's future is not determined through coercion. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine has further increased urgency and has inspired a number of allies to take greater steps uh, to ensure that such a crisis doesn't unfold in their own region. Uh, while the United States and South Korea for the first time included a reference on upholding peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait in their joint statements uh, in 2021, uh, the ROK has been relatively more cautious uh, compared to other U.S. allies, such as Japan, on discussing and, and preparing for contingencies in the Taiwan Strait and, and in diplomatically supporting Taipei. And this caution, uh, of course, is driven by a desire not to upset relations with Beijing, uh, especially given Seoul's painful experience with Chinese economic retaliation uh, in 2017. 
And also the fact that I think the ROK's first and foremost concern remains deterring a conflict on the Korean Peninsula. The challenge is Beijing understands this difference in priorities between South Korea and the United States. And I think it has and will continue to use these disparities to, to try to drive a wedge between the allies, especially when it comes to coordination on Taiwan or to various initiatives in the Indo-Pacific. And I think this poses difficulties for the US ROK to manage their alliance as well as the management of ROK China relations. Uh, I think that's about my five minutes. So let me stop here for now. And I look forward to delving deeper into any of these threads during the discussion. Thank you, Patricia. Um, last but not least, uh, let me ask uh, Greg Brzezinski, a professor of history and international affairs at GW to share his view uh -huh of uh, 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 the US approach uh, to, to the, the future of rock, uh, China relations. Uh, Greg serves uh, also as the director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies and the director of the Asian Studies Program at the Elio School of International Affairs, Greg. Okay, thank you, Yanho. And it's also a pleasure to be here with the other panelists today. Um, I'm going to also talk a little bit about the U.S. outlook, but I'm going to try to uh, talk about it from a slightly different perspective from um, what Patricia said. And I, I think if you look at, um, if there's any consensus in China, South Korea, North Korea, the U.S., it's that we are starting to enter into a new Cold War with China. And I think this emerging Cold War is going to cause the United States or motivate the United States to seek closer cooperation with South Korea in several different areas. Some of them are the more traditional areas, military and strategic, but there are also some non-traditional areas and other forms of power. I think one of the most renowned scholars of the Cold War, John Lewis Gaddis, noted in a book that he wrote back in the late 90s, we now know that if you really look at the history of the first Cold War, military power was actually not the most important form of power. Other types of power, economic, cultural, and ideological power played equally, if not more important roles in determining the actual outcome of the Cold War and in protecting America's interests and core values. And I think this very much seems like it's going to be the case in America's new competition with China as well, uh, even though I think Sino-American rivalry has many differences from uh, the Cold War that the United States engaged in with the Soviet Union during the 1950s through the 1970s, I think uh, there are a number of similarities as well, and I think in particular that these alternative forms of power will be as important as military and strategic power, and that these forms of power will all have a very strong influence on U.S. ROK relations. The first of these is that I want to talk about is economic power and the technological supremacy upon which economic power rests. South Korea is, of course, in a very difficult bind economically because its economy is still very closely connected with China. Recent developments in relations between China and uh, South Korea and the declining popularity of China among South Koreans have, of course, made South Koreans more supportive of what we call decoupling at the theoretical level. But there's still a logistical question as to what extent it's actually possible for even the United States to decouple from China, let alone South Korea. Nevertheless, we already are seeing measures such as the recent US Chips and Science Act, which incentivizes South Korea and Taiwan to invest more in chip manufacturing in the United States. The United States has already approached Samsung on this issue. And you could see this, of course, when uh, Biden met with South Korean President Yoon at a South Korean semiconductor plant and lauded it specifically as an example of potential ties between the United States and Asia. So there's some opportunity that this provides. Uh, but at the same time, 
Uh, of course, companies like Samsung and SK Hynix all have significant investments in China and in chip manufacturing there. Uh, similarly, the United States has, of course, recently proposed this so-called Chip 4 alliance, which includes Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. Uh, and uh, South Korea's participation in this is, of course, not guarantee, guaranteed. The, the question really is what South Korea will do. Uh, will it stop doing business with China as the United States hopes, or it will, will it continue trying to straddle between China and uh, the United States? A second area where I think the United States and South Korea will move closer together is in the cultural realm or soft power. And of course, the first things that comes to mind are K-pop, K-drama, and K-cinema. And, and of course, the interesting dynamic here is these were at first very popular in China, uh, but Xi Jinping's government has increasingly uh, been increasingly repressive when it comes to South Korean pop culture. And uh, a lot of these South Korean cultural producers are going to find it's uh, difficult to maintain profitability in China, and it even is becoming a slight source of frictions. For instance, uh, in the case of Squid Game, not only was it banned in China, but internet searches for Squid Game were also blocked. And uh, part of the, the problem this creates is that China, uh, that, that uh, South Korean dramas and music and film uh, have been heavily uh, pirated in China. Finally, though, I would say that South Korea's soft power extends beyond possible, uh, beyond popular culture. Also critical is the fact that it has become a, pro a prosperous democracy and it advertises itself that way to the rest of the world. The contrast between South Korea and North Korea as well as the contrast between South Korea and China is one that makes South Korea generally look very attractive to other countries in Asia and around the world. And I think what the United States is likely to do is to work with South Korea in the coming years to advertise the country's democratic values, to advertise its success as a democracy. Uh, it's similar to what we can expect uh, the United States to do with Taiwan. This can send an important message to people in Asia and other parts of the world where the United States and China are competing because Cold Wars are not only about who is stronger, but they're also about whose values can resonate more with the rest of the world. And so I think American efforts to combat Chinese influence during the next few years will be both blunt and subtle, uh, but we can also be fairly certain that whatever form these efforts take, strategic or less traditional forms of power, South Korea will play an important role in overall U.S. strategy. Thank you, Greg. Uh, before we start the uh, roundtable discussion, I'd like to remind the uh, attendees that we are taking questions from you, and the Q&A box is already open. So when you type in your questions, please make sure to identify your name and affiliation. Uh, now, let me open it up for a round table discussion. I guess, um, Xiao, uh, you must have a lot of uh, uh, things uh, uh, to discuss or uh, in terms of responding to all the comments uh, that uh, your colleagues today um, you know, made. Uh, let me ask Xiao Ho uh, to uh, make his comment first and Hung Yu, you're next. Okay, so uh, there are a couple of questions. So the question one from Mark uh, Tokola. Uh, we're going to deal with the questions later on. So uh, uh, let's reserve the questions for the Q&A session. Mm. So uh, I'd like to ask you to respond to other speakers' comments. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, I would like to uh, respond to uh, Greg and uh, the comments. Yes, you are right, and uh, South Koreans uh, can play a lot of role uh, on the softer side of international 
politics and particularly the pop cultures and uh, uh, high tech uh, studies and even education. But nonetheless, I like to emphasize in Northeast Asians, the geopolitics prevails. Because uh, in this region, we witness as the two the fundamental phenomena. One is uh, uh, the North Korea's uh, uh, related issues, and, uh, and another one is the United States and the China strategic competition. And the two things are closely connected and uh, push other country in this region and the country beyond this region to take a side on some of the more fundamental questions. And the hard power still matters, still matters. So that's the basic reason why the North Korea has developed its new nuclear and the missile weapons. Now, North Korea has entered a new stage from acquiring nuclear weapons to prepare to use nuclear weapons. So that will create a tremendous impact, uh, not only on the South Korean, but also on Japan, China, United States, and uh, other countries across the world. So we're gonna see in the years to come, how South Korea responds to such a kind of military threat from the North. How the Japan respond North Korea's missiles uh, uh, fly over uh, its territory, its skies. So, so this kind of things will unfold in in the years to come, and the nuclear issues will occupy a central positions in I think the in 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 countries a security agenda in these regions. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I ask uh, uh, the uh, uh, question to Xiaohe and also comments on uh, Greg's you know, remarks. Uh, uh, looking at the formation of a new standing you know, Politburo committee, uh, I'm a bit uh, surprised because of uh, you know, concentration of power on the, uh, in the hand of uh, Xi Jinping. And <laughs> And uh, would you explain a little bit more uh, what is the reasoning behind that? And there is a, a culture and also it's a necessity for certain you know, uh, uh, policies. And also what are the implications of foreign policies to you know, uh, the in, uh, Chinese, uh, in uh, Chinese foreign policies, I mean, uh, especially to uh, you know, Korea. Okay, uh, my comments on uh, you know, Greg's uh, Greg mentioned the Chief Four Alliance. This is not the alliance. This is the kind of, kind of uh, you know, initial stage of uh, the consultation. So there is no reason for South Korea uh, uh, not to participate. We will join that. And uh, we will, you know, avidly uh, participate at the, uh, the kind of consultation. But the formation of, uh, you know, alliance in the, uh, the so-called Chief Four uh, it's going to be extremely difficult, especially, uh, you know, Taiwan. And also uh, maybe uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, business groups in the United States. So how to, uh, you know, make a consultation or uh, adjust the kind of interest in, uh, among or between uh, countries and also enterprise it are not easy, uh, you know, things. So it's a long way to go. So of course, South Korea will uh, you know, actively uh, join. And then also still, as I mentioned before, uh, we are uh, worried about the uh, you know, uh, US policies at the expense of uh, you know, uh, the allies. Uh, I really fear the uh, kind of uh, deficiency of uh, you know, consultation among and in uh, US uh, you know, uh, bureaus and then also the some uh, policymakers. So without you know, uh, 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 harmonizing uh, the uh, you know, policies, uh, one department or a, an organ of uh, policymakers just issued, and then uh, the consequences, uh, quite uh, you know, uh, not necessary uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, positive to the uh, alliance relations and the uh, you know foreign policies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask Xiaoho to respond to Hung Yu's question and then uh, ask Greg to, uh, to whatever comments he has about, uh, I guess, Hung Yu's comments. Okay, uh, thank you, Hing Yu, <laughs> for your uh, very sensitive questions. And uh, uh, it's very difficult for me to answer these questions, but uh, I would uh, like to highlight uh, some things probably we need to keep in mind. Number one, and Xi Jinping has been widely regarded as core leader of the Chinese Communist Party and the whole China. And, and uh, that's the one thing. And the second, to come, uh, yeah, if Xi Jinping were, uh, has been widely regarded as core leader and he has a legitimate reason to concentrate power at his hands in order to fulfill some unfinished businesses in his first and the second terms, uh, such as the national unifications, as well as continue to push for uh, to 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 crack down on on the on the corruptions across China, and also continue to push for so one by one road, and uh, there's a lot of things he hasn't finished in in his first and the second terms, and also so I like to emphasize, and Xi Jinping was uh, elected to uh, serve as a party secretary for his third term and by the member of the Central Committee of the Council Parties. So he was elected and uh, he was bestowed by all kinds of powers and privilege by the, by the Central Committee and the, the parties. Hmm. And uh, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you, Greg. Um, I would, yeah, I'd like to respond to a few uh, of the points that some of the other uh, panelists men made. Um, first, uh, Professor Chung's point uh, that geopolitics prevails. I, I would just say a couple of things. Number one, I'm not saying that geopolitics and military and strategic power are not important. But the question is, um, you know, what what is the relative importance? And I think that's something that still hasn't been completely decided. I think what happened in the Cold War that was, you know, uh, engaged in between uh, 1947 and 1991 is that militarily it became stalemated. So there wasn't an actual military conflict between the great powers. And I think if once it becomes stalemated militarily, then these other factors such as economy and culture and core values become more important. So if you think there's going to be military conflict and the rivalry between the United States and China is going to be decided militarily, then yes, uh, geopolitics are going to prevail and military might is going to prevail. But if you think it's going to be a Cold War and it's not going to be decided militarily or through war, then what will decide it, right? And that's where I think other forms of power become very uh, much important, very much important. So that's how I see it. Uh, maybe I'm drawing too sharp of a dichotomy, but that's my general view. Um, Professor uh, Kim's point uh, uh, in terms of the CHIP4 alliance, is it an alliance? Um, all I can say is that in the United States and in the American media, it's being called an alliance. Uh, and I do agree with you that South Korea's willingness to participate in it, if it's a, uh, an alliance, is, is still undetermined. From what I see as an observer in the United States who reads South Korean media from time to time, though, uh, I see it being reported that President Yoon is becoming more and more sympathetic to this idea. I don't know that he's completely bought into it. He may just be saying this to satisfy the United States because he knows Taiwan and Japan aren't going to go for it. But that's what I see from my point of view in uh, Washington. Okay, Patricia? 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, Hung, you talked about soaring nationalism and mutual negative views among younger generations and a difference in values driving tensions uh, uh, between the ROK and China and, of course, the U.S. and China as well. Uh, I, you know, I tend to agree with that assessment, and I'm particularly concerned about the deterioration of people-to-people -people ties, which really impacts the long-term trajectory of a relationship. Um, and this is really, I think the ties have deteriorated even more during the pandemic uh, with uh, uh, Chinese experts, for instance, not able to travel here to Washington or just a really uh, a reduction in track 1.5 or track two types engagements. And I think that's very dangerous. So, um, so I have two questions. Uh, first along on those themes uh, for Xiao He, uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on the sentiments and values among younger generations in China and what this portends for China's approach towards South Korea as well as the United States. Uh, and then the second question for you again is, you know, you talk, we talked about the concentration uh, of power uh, in China and uh, you mentioned that this is seen as necessary for Xi to carry out unfinished business from his uh, first two terms, and you mentioned national unification as one piece of unfinished business. Uh, you know, it's, that's very ominous to hear. I would ask that you expand upon this. And I would note that here in the United States, uh, among China watchers, there's a debate about whether Xi's concentration of power would give him the space to take time on Taiwan and to maybe try diplomacy and to lean more on carrots that China hasn't in recent years, or if this would empower him to push faster on a unification timeline with Taiwan. And so how do you see the concentration of power impacting Beijing's decision-making when it comes to managing, uh, managing the issue of Taiwan? And related to this is uh, you know, on, a, or on a more broader level, where do you see China's regional diplomacy and its diplomacy with the United States going in the post 20th party Congress period? So among the more optimistic assessments that I've heard is that now that this big internal event has passed, Beijing will have more bandwidth and will to stabilize many of the relationships that have suffered in recent years. Um, and others have said that no, Beijing will just continue on course. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for Patricia's uh, very uh, challenging questions. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. And also, so uh, for uh, so, uh, and, um, Patricia has mentioned the, the regional diplomacies with another channel. We're going to change or maintain the course. I think it's uh, this isn't some kind of a slight changes uh, or, or on China's uh, uh, regional diplomacies, and uh, but nonetheless, uh, when we look at the oh, we lost Xiao again. Okay, uh, before we open it up for Q and A, uh, we have uh, about fifteen minutes left. Let me ask Hung Yu to share his thoughts about uh, South Korea's views. Of, uh, of the outcomes of the, uh, the 20th uh, Party Congress in China uh, in terms of the future of, of rock china relations? Any concerns? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, of course, uh, South Koreans uh, pay very special attention to the outcomes of the 20th Party uh, Congress because, you know, uh, South Korea is adjacent to China, and then we are heavily influenced by the changes of the Chinese domestic politics always. You know, whenever there is ch there, there were changes of a Chinese dynasty in uh, Chinese mainland China, there was a war between, uh, you know, Koreans and then uh, Chinese. We, uh, according to, uh, you know, a researcher, uh, throughout the history, uh, you know, uh, uh, we waged the war uh, uh, with Chinese people more than 450 times. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a tremendous, you know, uh, occasions. So uh, uh, South Koreans, uh, including North Koreans, uh, uh, you know, DNA in the blood, always uh, there is uh, apprehension of uh, Chinese, uh, you know, growing influence over the Korean Peninsula. So. Uh, uh, we pay very special attention to the uh, Chinese, uh, uh, the uh, 
Chinese uh, uh, Party Congress, and then uh, many experts uh, pointed out uh, uh, the concentration of uh, Xi Jinping's power is not necessary to be uh, positive to the uh, security of South Korea. Uh, uh, they worry about the you know, uh, increasing tensions and the maybe uh, possibly uh, conflict with China in the, uh, in, in the near future. But however, in my perspective, uh, I do not think China will take that kind of adventurous uh, you know, actions in the near future because uh, current Chinese leadership is uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, the so-called scientific materialist, not uh, adventurous, adventurous like uh, Mao Zedong. They have uh, grown out of uh, you know, Mao Zedong's you know, uh, the kind of uh, big uh, mistakes in uh, taking adventurism. So uh, they will uh, focus on uh, more on the basis like uh, productivity and then uh, you know economic relations, and then uh, you know increase the influence their you know upper structure. So that's the basic. Uh, so uh, China Chinese approach will be uh, might might be uh, you know uh, different from what we thought. And uh, so uh, all the time being, China will pay more attention to the uh, uh, better relationship with South Korea and neighboring countries. So whenever China uh, faced the kind of uh, challenges from great powers. Uh, they, uh, uh, they changed their policies to focus on the uh, neighboring uh, countries. And then uh, on the basis of the uh, good relationship with neighboring countries, uh, they again, uh, you know, challenge the uh, new, uh, you know, international, uh, you know, uh, stage. And then so uh, for the time being, uh, I, 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 I hope and then uh, China will be very good at uh, to uh, Koreans. And uh, they will suggest uh, lots of things to Koreans. Uh, but the problem is, whether uh, uh, how concrete the policies and the how good for the you know, public goods uh, and the, to uh, uh, stability and then, you know, peace in the uh, international relations, especially in uh, Northeast Asia. So uh, uh, still, uh, you know, we carefully watch over Chinese every inch of moves and then also the changing policies, but uh, uh, I'm not that uh, pessimistic, uh, I mean, in a short term. Thank you. Uh, Patricia and Greg, uh, did you want to uh, briefly discuss uh, American views of the outcomes of the uh, 20th uh, Party Congress uh, in terms of uh, future, the future of uh, Korea-China relations? Well, I, I would say first, um, uh, there's actually going to be a Seeger Center event on that very topic November 4th. So I wanted to just plug that event uh, while we're while we're here, it will be in person at the Elliott School. Uh, but I, I think generally, um, you know, if 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 there is a I, I think generally the U.S. view of the 20th Party Congress and its outcome is that it's it's led number one, uh, as we've said, to a consolidation of Xi Jinping's power. And that this uh, will, you know, potentially have negative ramifications for Sino-American relations because you're going to, you know, much as you see continuing consensus within the CCP around Xi Jinping, uh, this is in turn going to lead to continuing consensus in the Congress and, um, you know, in the White House about, um, you know, th about the idea that China poses a potential threat. And so this sort of hardening of stances in both the United States and China is going to continue. And I, I also think in terms of what images of the party Congress were most often presented, I, you know, one of them was of sort of Hu Jintao being uh, dragged away. So there's this sort of um, you know, uh, th this was this was sort of one of the most frequently uh, circulating uh, images or videos from the, the of the Congress in the United States, and uh, I, I think that sort of represents uh, how it's viewed uh, in some regard. So, so uh, you know, I'm going to be a speaker at Greg's event on the 20th Party Congress. So this will be a small preview of what I plan to talk about. But um, just to put in a nutshell, I mean, I personally was struck with the outcomes of the Congress of how um, none of Beijing's recent challenges, whether it's the economic woes or dissatisfaction with its pretty extreme zero COVID policies, 
as well as the deterioration of many of its foreign relationships have really dented um, Xi Jinping's grip on power. And so I was struck by the consolidation of power that we saw. I think the official confirmation of Xi's third term and his status as the core of the party, these were expected, um, but I think the unveiling of the top leadership and the fact that it's completely staffed by those who are loyal to Xi Jinping suggests that the party has essentially given him the absolute power that he says is necessary to steer his country towards national rejuvenation. Um, I, I think these outcomes suggest that there's really no checks and balances in the Chinese system at this point, and Beijing will essentially double down on the more aggressive um, postures we've seen both at home and abroad that has characterized Xi Jinping's rules uh, since 2012. And um, I don't really see a major course correction coming in the Chinese political system. And I don't think this bodes well for US-China relations or for China ROK relations. Thank you. Uh, let me take some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question is from Mark Tokola uh, at the Korea Economic Institute. This question is, uh, would China prefer a united or a divided Korean peninsula? Xiao? Okay, so uh, my, my answer is very simple. China is not in, in any kind of position to oppose Korea unification simply because China itself is a divided country. As long as China try to achieve unification, national unifications, well, and why China oppose other countries to achieve unifications, I think it's China is not in the position to oppose it. So, uh, not divide the countries, so maybe for your safety. <laughs> <laughs> divide two political entities, <laughs> maybe China and Taiwan. <laughs> I think we, we have a uh, um, similar question for for South Korea here. A uh, question from Sarah Marshall, uh, National Security Institute at uh, George Mason University. Is reunification on the radar of the uh, UN administration at all? Uh, there has always been a resistance uh, to angering China too, too much because of its relationship with North Korea and its potential to help with reunification, but is the prospect of reunification even present anymore? So what's the uh, Korea's view of reunification? Yeah, North Korea, uh, you know, uh, was quite successful in arming the nuclear and the waste that there is uh, missile capabilities. So it's extremely difficult for us to uh, unite it uh, in the near future. And the North Korea would not abandon its uh, nuclear and missile capabilities. Then, uh, you know, United States and uh, uh, South Korea cannot force them uh, to be with us. Uh, so uh, they have to make their own decision. And then uh, the, uh, uh, what is then uh, China's role here? And then we had a certain high uh, expectation of Chinese utility in the unification process. But, uh, you know, uh, in the process of uh, denuclearization uh, efforts, and uh, South Korea was quite, uh, you know, disappointed. And then, uh, you know, uh, China failed, uh, even though China is saying uh, differently. But uh, uh, so, uh, now South Korea is uh, much more perceived the uh, the part of a threat of, uh, coming from China in the future. So and also the danger of uh, you know a disruption of uh, supply chains. So how to manage them? Uh, this is the key uh, you know challenges to the US government uh, ahead of uh, you know unification efforts. So it's going to be a long term uh, you know process for uh, uh, unification uh, for South Korea's perspective. Uh, we have one comment and one question about Greg's uh, uh, comments on uh, the South Korea's democracy and soft power. And I'd like to encourage all the speakers to, um, to read uh, the comments made by KBO, which is posted in the Q&A now. And the Sun Ho Kim, um, a first year graduate student at Elio School, um, asked a question a related question about uh, uh, Greg's comments. So um, to be short, um, 
He said, uh, the question here is how valuable ideological and cultural factors are, if at all, and in what sense for China in keeping, uh, for China in keeping or developing relationships with other countries. So Xiao, do, do you have any, any further comments on this? Mm. I don't see I don't see the questions and uh, because I withdraw from the conference rooms, but uh, uh, I would like to, to let other speakers to to answer first. Okay, Greg. Uh, thank you and uh, thank you first, Katie, uh, for your comment. I I actually agree a lot with the the points that you raised and uh, just this uh, disillusionment with China that has occurred in the United States over the last uh, two, or th two or three decades with um, you know, the image of China slowly moving from a country that was developing rapidly economically, uh, but eventually it was going to liberalize and democratize. And it was really that assumption, I think, that enabled the United States to have a good relationship with China, or at least made a good relationship with China palatable uh, to many Americans who believe it's their mission to uh, spread democracy around the world. Uh, but I think your point also speaks to uh, the general importance of culture and our underlying values in uh, determining strategic rivalry, because uh, ultimately, if China had followed the course that the United States had thought it was going to follow, uh, and had liberalized and democratized, today we wouldn't be talking about Sino-American rivalry and a new Cold War. So I, I think if, if, you know, if the two countries shared a common set of uh, political and ideological values, and again, that's not saying that um, geostrategic interests um, isn't important, but I think uh, he, you know, in, in, in the end, countries that share common sets of political and ideological values are a lot less likely to come into conflict with each other than two countries that have uh, differing, uh, uh, you know, sharply different political systems and sharply different values in terms of the international order that they aspire to create. And I think, um, you know, uh, to, to, I don't know if I can answer Sunho's question completely, uh, but I think uh, he asks at the end, uh, in what sense uh, is, are these important for China in keeping or developing relationships with other countries? And I do think one of the interesting things about uh, Beijing and uh, the CCP is they have been putting a greater emphasis on soft power and cultural diplomacy uh, during the last 10 years. And we've, uh, you know, we've seen they've invested more in it. One of the problems I think is that when it comes to soft power, uh, China isn't very good at it. Uh, it punches well below its weight. And if you compare, you know, culturally the number of um, you know, people who's, uh, who speak Mandarin in the world is much, much greater than the number of people who speak uh, Korean. Uh, you know, Mandarin is the most common mother tongue in the world. Korean is about the 12th or 13th most common mother tongue in the world. Uh, but if you look at whose culture is popular globally and in Asia, it's South Korea, right? K-pop is, is extremely you know, popular, not only in Korea, but also Southeast Asia, South Asia, and here in the United States. Uh, the same with uh, dramas. And, you know, China just, um, you know, I think partially because of uh, its, its political system inhibits uh, creativity. Uh, but uh, because of that, uh, it's just, um, you know, it, it's the appeal of its dramas to people around the world, uh, the appeal of its cultural production to people around the world isn't anywhere close to South Korea's. And I think that's part of the reason why South Korea is going to play such an important role in US soft power strategies going forward, because it's another Asian country. It's a country that also has uh, been a victim of colonialism, but yet it's, it, you know, it's gone in a very different direction from uh, China and from North Korea. And it's a direction that I think the United States is 
betting will look more attractive to other people around the world. And I think uh, if, if, again, if it's going to be a Cold War and not a military struggle, then those are the kinds of things that may be decisive. So I, I, I've sort of gone off on a tangent a little bit, but I hope I've uh, answered uh, Katie and Sunho's uh, points uh, to some degree. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'd like to thank all the distinguished speakers for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank our GIVIX team, especially uh, Sean Dolan, our program manager for putting this together. And of course, thank you all for joining us. With that, let me conclude today's webinar. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>